Shalom, shalom. Professor Noam Chomsky is an American linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, historian, social critic, and political activist. Professor Chomsky holds a joint appointment as Institute Professor Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and Laureate Professor at the University of Arizona, and is the author of more than 100 books on the topics of linguistics, war, politics, and mass media. Professor Chomsky, thanks so much for taking this time. Pleased to be with you. So just to jump right in, um, uh, you are trained as a linguist. How did you become more involved as an activist? After I was an activist, long before I heard of linguistics, uh, as a child, in fact. Uh, in fact, my uh, discovery of linguistics happened to be through activist connections. Uh, long story. But uh, they've been side by side practically all my life. Fascinating. And um, in in what ways did your Jewish upbringing contribute to to your act to your activism or your activist outlook? Well, my initial activism for many years and and part continues to the present uh, had to do with what was then Palestine, which is now Israel. Uh, I grew up in a and uh, my parents were heavily involved in uh, uh, the revival of Hebrew, Jewish education, uh, the uh, development of a, a Jewish uh, center in uh, what was then Palestine. Uh, I, this is from my, um, I was a, I went to Hebrew school, Hebrew college, was a Hebrew teacher, uh, uh, organizer of Hebrew youth groups. Uh, uh, this was, uh, I was very much involved in what at the time was called Zionism. It's now called anti Zionism. It was uh, an effort to try to move towards some form of Arab Jewish cooperation in Palestine, aiming perhaps to, for, to some uh, kind of binational federation or something like that. Of course, that ended in 1948, and things took on a different complexion, but I have stayed very much involved in it. Uh, the, other, the other aspect of uh, Hebrew education, uh, studying the Bible, some study of Talmud, of modern Hebrew literature, uh, uh, all of that is just part of my general uh, background as, uh, in, in life. Were there particular Jewish values that resonated most for you that continue to animate your thinking? Well, as in any complex culture, there are all sorts of values. So you pick and choose. And uh, the ones I would like to pick and choose are, uh, for example, the, uh, a line from uh, my Haftarah portion. Uh, uh, I like to think that that's a slogan to live with. Very nice. So um, we obviously live in very uh, divisive times today. Um, and I wonder, is it possible to act in the name of morality and be above the, the partisan politics of today? Oh, definitely. Well, first of all, the, the partisan politics are a little bit misleading. Uh, there is polarization, but if you take a closer look, I think what you actually find is that both of the major political groupings, political parties, uh, have drifted to the right during the last roughly 50 years, mostly the neoliberal period. So today's Democrats, mainstream Democrats, are pretty much what used to be moderate Republicans. Uh, meanwhile, the Republican Party, especially since Gingrich, has gone way off to the right, far off the spectrum. If you look, and they're uh, very militant and committed. There are good reasons for this. There's a sharp split in the Republican Party between the uh, mainstream establishment position, the actual policies, and on the other hand, the voting base. They're quite different. Uh, their policies are so dedicated to the welfare of the very rich in the corporate sector that they can't get votes. So what they've therefore done is organized the voting base on other issues. 
and it uh, it can be a pretty unwholesome mix when you look at it. Yeah. Uh, the, but there, and that has led to what's called polarization. But the polarization is coming from the right, far right. In fact, yeah. it exemplifies it. But certainly, one can be outside of the system and uh, take one's own independent position on it. So what 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 um, what trends in American life right now do you uh, give you optimism? Um, and in in an, in its ideal form, what would you see of the role of America in the twenty first century global order? Well, right now, it's painful to say, but right at the moment, the United States' role is to take the lead in laboring to destroy the possibility of organized human life on earth sorry to say that but it's a fact yeah uh, we're facing serious existential crises uh, two one is the uh, global warming crisis uh, it's very severe it's imminent don't have much time to do something about it most of the world is trying to do at least something inadequate at some steps. The United States alone, aside from sidekicks like Brazil today, but the United States alone basically is racing toward the precipice. It's the policies are dedicated to maximizing the impact of a critical catastrophic uh, outcome that will in fact make life organized life on earth impossible in any form that we know. Now that has to be changed. Turning to optimism, yes, there are very strong popular groups, mostly young people, acting to try to change it. The climate strike uh, last month, which brought maybe seven or eight million people out into the streets, mostly young, uh, that was a remarkable critical event. Uh, it's uh, led to efforts to change policy. Uh, they may be effective, they better be effective when we're in trouble. That's only one of the series of crises. That one at least is discussed. The other is much less discussed and it may destroy us before uh, environmental crisis does. That's the rising threat of nuclear war. Uh, the US government is again taking the lead in increasing the extraordinary threat of nuclear annihilation. Uh, just in August, uh, President Trump uh, dismantled the Reagan-Gorbachev uh, INF Treaty, which had su significantly lessened the threat of war in Europe, which would quickly spread to the whole world, tore that up, and immediately carried out a test of a missile which violated the tre treaty basically entreating Russia and the rest of the world to develop comparable weapons to destroy us. Uh, the Open Skies Treaty initiated by Eisenhower, that's now on the chopping block. Uh, the New START Treaty, the last of the major treaties, Trump administration has already said if they're still in office, they won't sign it. Uh, that's a tremendous gift to the weapons manufacturers, uh, but for everyone else on earth, it's a opening the way to disaster. It's, and of course, the Russians are responding, the Chinese will respond, other countries will do the same. Uh, that's only one thing. Uh, there's another, the Middle East, which is a very uh, volatile, dangerous area. One thing the Trump administration has done is to pull the rug out of the major agreement, which uh, constrained, in fact, uh, uh, ended uh, uh, any uh, Iranian weapons production, if there was any, we don't know. Uh, he tore that apart. That's going to lead to increased, it's already leading to increased tensions. We don't know where that will go. Uh, I should mention at this point something that's never discussed. It's not permitted, but it's critically important. There is a way to end any concern that anyone might have about Iranian nuclear weapons production. Very simple way. 
institute a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East with verifiable inspections. And that can be done. Now, why doesn't it happen? Well, who's opposed? Not the Arab states. They've been, they initiated the proposal, been strongly advocating it for decades. Not Iran, which strongly supports it. Not the non so called non line movement, the global south, that's most of the world strongly supports it. The Europe supports it. It's blocked by one country, the United States. Uh, the issue comes up at regularly at the regular meetings of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the review meetings. Uh, the last one was 2015, when it was blocked by Obama. Uh, there's no doubt that the next one, it'll be blocked by Trump. Why? Everybody knows the reasons, nobody says it. The reasons are that if there is such a zone established, first, there'll have to be inspection of Israel's massive nuclear weapons program. US and Israel don't want that. Secondly, and most crucially, the US will have to admit publicly that Israel has a nuclear weapons program. Of course, they know they do, and everyone else knows too, but you're not supposed to say it. Because if it's formally admitted under US law, all US military aid to Israel is going to have to cease signing to an amendment. So a lot's at stake. And for that reason, uh, the countries of the world cannot move to end what is claimed to be a major threat and uh, are uh, allowing uh, serious dangers to grow, which might end up in terrible, devastating war. Mm -hmm. We should face that fact, especially those of us who are interested in Israel and the region. You argue quite convincingly in your article the responsibility of intellectuals that America, American or more broadly Western intellectuals need to leverage their privilege in order to call out their respective governments on various atrocities. And I wonder what are some of the ways you've seen this be successful over the past decades in America and, and today? There have, I mean, all through history, back to uh, uh, the biblical prophets, Take a look at that period. Who are the prophets? I mean, the word prophet is a bad translation of an obscure Hebrew word. But from our, if we look at them from our perspective, the prophets were pretty much what we now call dissident intellectuals. So the prophet Elijah was called uh, an Ocher Yisrael, a hater of Israel by King Ahab, Baha, uh, because he was criticizing the crimes of the evil crimes. The king. Uh, prophets were driven into the desert, uh, uh, jailed, punished, because they were calling, they were condemning the, the geostrategic strategies of the kings, which were going to lead to disaster. They were calling for uh, mercy for uh, widows and orphans and so on. Uh, they were carrying out the role of what we now call dissident intellectuals. And they were treated very harshly. Uh, the people who were treated well at those years were the flatterers at the court, uh, the ones who were later called false prophets many years later. That's a pattern that has existed through history. At roughly the same time, it was happening in classical Greece. Uh, the person who had to drink the hemlock suicide was the one who was corrupting the youth of Athens by asking too many questions and raising uh, trying to get people to think. All through history, it's the same. Right up to the present, take any country you like, you'll find there's a the large majority of the intellectual class, educated classes are basically inherit. They inherit the legacy of the flatterers at the court. They're uh, supportive of power. There's a fringe of critics, usually treated pretty badly. How badly depends on, uh, but they have had impact. In fact, they're a large part of the reason, along with popular movements that they're linked with for progress in human life. That goes back to the prophets and classical Greece, it runs all through history. 
We see it right in front of us today. Take what we were just talking about, uh, the climate strike and the general uh, popular movements to deal with not only environmental crises, but other major problems that face us. Mostly it's popular movements. There is a group of activists, call them intellectuals if you like, uh, people with some degree of privilege, uh, uh, access to information, um, access to modes of uh, uh, reaching out to the public and so on. Uh, they're part of it. Uh, that's their role and uh, that's what called uh, what Gramsci called organic intellectuals linked to popular movements uh, have made changes, brought about changes in the past, uh, will in the future. But let's take just as an example the what I mentioned, the uh, Reagan Gorbachev INF Treaty, 1987. Uh, take a look at the background for that. The background was a huge uh, a popular uprising in Europe and the United States. Many millions of people demanding uh, an end to the nuclear confrontation. Against that background, two leaders were able to reach a historic agreement which did contribute substantially to 20 years of peace. It's now been torn apart. Uh, one of the, uh, William Perry, the former defense secretary, who spent his whole life in uh, dealing with nuclear issues and is a, a pretty sober and conservative commentator, commentator, not given to exaggeration. He really said, recently said he's terrified. In fact, doubly terrified terrified by the growing threat of nuclear war, terrified by the fact that intellectuals and others are saying very little about it. And we should also be double, triply terrified because our leaders are racing towards destruction while this is happening. But as we've seen in the past, I just gave one example, there are thousands of uh, uh, engaged, active public with participation of privileged people with access to information and public forums that can make a difference. Yeah. So um, before we can think about repenting for the past sins of the of the US, uh, obviously, we have to stop the enormous, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems that are occurring today um, uh, that you've that you've only touched on. If we were to begin with a new order of 2020, uh, in 2020 and beyond, um, what would it look like for the U.S. to repent for past uh, uh, for past social ills? But it would. So I, I didn't hear the last words. What would it look like for for the U.S. to begin a process of repentance for our our historical political shortcomings? Well, there are plenty of them. Uh, let's take uh, one particular. Take uh, two groups of Americans. Uh, one of them. African Americans. Uh, they have a 400 year history here. The first part of the history was the most vicious system of slavery that has ever existed in human history. And slavery goes way back. But there's been nothing like, this, like the, uh, the concentration camps in the South uh, where uh, the African Americans labored under hideous conditions. Uh, not never before seen in slave society. That also happened to create the basis of their own wealth and privilege. Uh, cotton was the oil of the 19th century. Uh, cheap cotton produced by slavery, vicious slavery, uh, was the basis for the creation of manufacturing, textiles, uh, finance, uh, uh, commerce, of course, uh, retail, trade, for the United States, for England, uh, also for indirectly for other countries on their own on their own development. Uh, what happened at the end? There was a formal end to slavery. Okay, 1865. There were 10 years in which blacks had relative freedom. Reconstruction years that ended uh, with a compromise with North and South that basically allowed. Of the southern slave states to do what they wanted. They reinstituted slavery. In fact, one of the uh, 
major books on the topic is called Slavery by Another Name. A uh, process of legalized slavery was reinstituted. Uh, blacks were not only uh, intimidated by vicious uh, atrocities, but black life was essentially criminalized. If a black man was seen standing on a corner, uh, he could be accused of vagrancy, uh, ordered to pay a fine, which he couldn't pay, uh, spent the rest of his life in jail. In fact, working in uh, working in manufacturing and agriculture. It went right on until the 1930s. Uh, then there was a period brief during the Second World War and the first couple of decades uh, uh, after the war when the, there was a kind of a beginnings of an opening for African Americans to enter the general society. Black man could get a job in an auto factory. So make a fairly decent salary, maybe get enough money to buy a small home. One problem, uh, federal housing was legally segregated into the late 60s. A black man couldn't get a home in the new developments that were being built by the government that were benefiting the post early post-war generation. Uh, by the time that ended, uh, it, uh, uh, stag the neoliberal stagnation set in. Uh, uh, manufacturing jobs began to disappear, wages stagnated, uh, the opportunity was lost. Uh, meanwhile, extreme racism is maintained in many ways. Well, that's, and you can see the legacy. I mean, uh, black families have practically no, no wealth. You know, uh, they live in awful conditions and so on. A lot of the formal barriers have been eliminated, but not the cultural and structural ones. Well, that's one part, major part of the population. There's another part. The people who used to live here, the Indian nations, uh, they've, the United States is a pretty unusual country in many ways. Many achievements, uh, many, uh, many to be proud of, but some that are pretty ugly. The United States is an unusual country that has been at war for almost every year since its founding. Uh, one of the major reasons for the American Revolution was uh, a royal proclamation by King George, which barred settlement uh, west of the Allegheny Mountains. Settlers weren't where the Indian nations lived. Uh, settlers weren't having any of this. Settler colonists wanted to go to the left, to the west, to uh, land speculators like George Washington who wanted to purchase lands in the, in the west for speculative reasons. Uh, the revolution, one of the main re reasons for the revolution was to revoke that. As soon as it was won, the aggression into the Indian nations began, went right through the 19th century. Uh, leading to virtual extermination. Uh, then comes broken treaties, all kind of atrocities and so on. We don't have to go through it. Uh, the end result, uh, the remnants of uh, the, uh, m m the level of massacre is overwhelming. There are remnants. They live under deeply impoverished conditions, uh, uh, little educational opportunity, uh, other opportunities. Uh, it's another sector of American society. That's not all. Uh, poor whites have, you know, what are sometimes called white trash, uh, live under pretty awful conditions. Uh, what about them? What about the general population? A uh, study just came out, major study a couple of days ago, uh, studying the quality of work in the United States. We're supposed to be happy at what's called low unemployment. Take a list of jobs. Uh, by, if you go back to say 1990, uh, about 50% of jobs were above the median, you know, sort of relatively the jobs you could live on. Almost two thirds are below. The new jobs that are formed are precarious, low salary, service, uh, uh, no benefits. Uh, 
Uh, yes, there are jobs, but not jobs of any decent quality for most of the population. Uh, that's part of the general impact of neoliberal programs that largely instituted under Reagan, extended by Clinton and since, uh, which have led to radical concentration of wealth, uh, stagnation, or worse for much of the majority of the population. Uh, by now, the figures are stunning. Um, 0.1%, not 1%, 0.1% of the population have over 20% of the wealth. Half the population has negative net worth. Uh, uh, debts larger than assets. I mean, you can't, if some emergency takes place, an automobile accident, you're stuck. Uh, the health system is a international scandal. It's uh, almost twice the cost of comparable countries with relatively poor outcomes, uh, uh, getting worse in many ways. Uh, all of these, and here we're talking about the majority of the population, not just sectors that have had a particularly brutal uh, history. So there's plenty to do, and there are plenty of resources to do it. This is the richest country in the world. It has absolutely incomparable advantages. There's no other country that has basically pretty homogeneous population and culture. You can go from Boston to Los Angeles and think you're in the same place. Uh, uh, unparalleled agricultural resources, uh, mineral resources, uh, scientific resources, achievements. Uh, many very progressive achievements which are unfortunately now under threat. It yeah. takes a public education system. Mass public education was an American innovation and a very significant one. I mean, it opened opportunities from you know, the kindergarten to college, land grant colleges, to large masses of the population in a way which didn't exist anywhere else. I mean, even in England, this something comparable didn't really start until after the Second World War. In the United States, it goes back to the 19th century. That's a major achievement under attack. One of our major achievements is now under assault. Efforts to uh, defund, marginalize, uh, uh, regiment the public education system is pretty shocking. Uh, we have, the point is we have the capacity and resources. We have to mobilize them. Yeah. And fortunately, there are uh, growing sectors of the population, mostly young, which are engaged in such efforts. And that's why you have things like the uh, Sanders movement. Well, we only have three minutes left here, and I want to honor your time. Um, and my last question um, is one you could talk about for hours, but maybe you could just offer a brief uh, reflection for a minute or two. And it has to do with how we create change, whether it's what's through education, what's through government structure, and the intersection of how you understand human behavior. You know, if Marx thought, thought it was about our socioeconomic status and Freud about our early childhood experiences and people like Spinoza and Einstein, you know, about our DNA or our, our inner disposition, how do you understand what makes people fundamentally make the choices they make? And how should that account for how we think about the, the type of massive things we need in society today? Well, that's a question that can be answered in three minutes. In fact, in 30 seconds, yeah. nobody has a clue. <laughs> we know, we understand at the level of science, at least, you know, organized, verifiable knowledge. There's very little understanding of human beings and their fundamental characteristics. Uh, we know a good deal about the, uh, the range of possibilities that are open to them that they can exploit. But what should they do? That's for them to choose. There are uh, values. Many of them go way back to classical times. I mentioned it a little bit. We go to the modern period, uh, uh, the uh, say the Enlightenment uh, formulated uh, ideals, which it can be pursued. Uh, one of the uh, leading uh, uh, 
theorists of the Enlightenment, figures in the Enlightenment, Wilhelm von Humboldt, the great humanist, the founder of the modern research university, great linguist. Uh, uh, his conception was that uh, human beings are born to inquire and create. That's the essence of human nature, to explore, to create, to investigate, and to change, to change the world so that it will meet those values. So, and he talked about very fundamental parts of our existence. Like take simply the fact that most people spend their, most of their working hours under what amount to totalitarian conditions. You go into your workplace, you're under totalitarian rule uh, of a kind that uh, a total Stalin and Hitler never even dreamed of. Now, they didn't tell you uh, how many minutes you have uh, to go to the bathroom or to talk to a friend or something like that, or to control your every emotion. Uh, Humboldt talked about, he of course didn't envision the industrial age, this is much before that, but he uh, talked about uh, artisans and said that if an artisan creates a beautiful object under command, we may admire what he did, but we despise what he is. Not a free, independent human being, but a serf under control of others. That's the way we spend a lot of our lives. That's not because people always wanted it that way. We go back to the early industrial revolution, uh, American work workers uh, bitterly objected to this uh, system of domination and control. Well, those are values that can be realized too. There's many ways in which we can create a just, fair, uh, decent society in which people should be proud of what they had achieved instead of uh, disgusted by the uh, oppression and violence that they see in front of them. The choices are there. The means are pretty obvious. You don't have to talk about them. It's a pretty free society. You don't get sent to the gulag if you do what we're doing right now. There are plenty of opportunities if we can, if we are willing to grasp them. Yeah. Professor Noam Chomsky, thank you so much for your time and insights and inspiration. Thank you. Wishing you lots of blessings for a long life and good health and lots of success in all your endeavors. Thank you very much.